Hey everyone, Chris Madsen here. The purpose of this video is to orient you to chapter eight of the guidebook, which is on the topic of mechanical fits. If you wanna be motivated on why we care about mechanical fits, we can't actually get the functionality we want out of our products if we don't understand mechanical fit. So check out the previous video that I made that gave a little bit of motivation for why we care about that. In this video, however, I wanna point out uh, that section 8.3 is a process for determining fits. It's a seven step process and you ought to go through that. And if you do, it's a methodical way to, to get the sizes of stuff that you need so that you'll end up with the parts working the way that you want them to. In order to orient you to all of the tables that are going on in this chapter, and there are a lot of them, I recognize that. Uh, I think what will be best for me to do is to simply go through example one that's near the end of the chapter and um, show you how it works out with all these tables. So I'm looking now at this part that says uh, mechanical fit examples. And I'm just gonna look at number one. And what we have here is it says, consider a whole shaft system. The nominal size of the shaft is two inches. By the way, if you don't know what is meant by the word nominal, it's time for you to go back to the beginning of the chapter and uh, do your reading, because in order to get an understanding of what's going on here, you've got to understand some key words. And one of those words is the nominal size. So now go back, check that out. I think that would be useful for you. I'm gonna assume that you know that at this point, okay? So consider a whole shaft system. The nominal size is two inches in diameter and it is six inches long. The, the system is to be used on a machine with medium running speeds and where minimal play is desired. What are the limits of size for the hole and the shaft? Use the whole standard. Again, if you're not sure what is meant by whole standard, you ought to take a look at uh, that description that's in the guidebook. I'm gonna assume also you know what that means and we're gonna go about just trying to do this. Okay, so there's a lot of things that are specified here in this uh, part of the example. A lot of things that are said and now we need to start to break it down and make sense of it. One way that I suggest that you do that is that you use the provided um, mechanical fits worksheet. This can be downloaded straight from the downloadable files for the, for the chapter. Um, okay, so this is interference. We're just gonna go right through this and it's gonna help us to know what's gonna, what's gonna happen, okay? I'm gonna switch this to, I guess to keep it on blue is fine, okay? This is interference between um, example one shaft and example one hole. All right. All right, so what we need to do is we need to figure out A, what functional relationship should exist between the mating parts. Okay, and we basically get to choose here. And we're gonna start at the kind of superset that's up here. Do we want sliding and rotating? Do we want positional relationships or do we want a fixed relationship? Well, we're gonna have to go back to the problem to see what was said. The system is to be used on a machine with medium running speeds and where minimal play is desired. Okay, so what this means then is we are going to have sliding and rotating relationships. And so let's just read through these and figure out which ones we want. Okay, look, I can already see right here, medium speeds where minimal play is desired. This is what we're after, okay? Now that we know what we want, we need to figure out which class is going to give us that kind of relationship. So that's what we do in part B. What mechanical fit class will produce the functional relationships we want? So we know that we are gonna be in the RC fit class. So that means we're going to need to look at this column, or excuse me, this row, RC1, RC2, all the way up to RC9, to know what we want. How are we going to decide which one that is? We better not randomly guess, that's not gonna get us anywhere. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go back to the first table that's in the chapter. I believe it's the first table that's in the chapter. Chapter, excuse me, table 8.1, running and sliding clearance fits. All right, now I get to look in here at what these say and decide which one I want. I actually remember the thing saying that we wanted a medium running fit which is what it says right here. Let's see, running fits on accurate machinery with high running speeds. 
Okay, we're doing minimal. We're doing. We are doing medium speeds. Um, uh, but that's okay. Medium speeds can also be run at high speeds. Uh, let's see. Slow running speeds. We're not doing slow running speeds. Here, medium running speeds. Okay. Medium running speeds where minimal play is desired. So now I'm actually seeing the exact words that we had before. Okay. So that's good. This means that we're probably going for an RC4 close running fit. Let's go back over here. And uh, oh, let's see, we'll have perceptible play. This is on standard shafts, spindles, and sliding rods. Okay. So have we chosen a good class? Let's just go read the example again. The system is to be used on a machine with medium running speeds and where minimal play is desired. Okay, we want to make sure we get this decision right. If we do not have this particular decision right, we are going to do a bunch of calculations that are not going to be good for us. Okay, running fits on accurate machinery with medium running speeds and where minimal play is desired. It will, however, have perceptible play. Okay, excellent. So we know that we want to be in RC4 then. So I'm going back over to the worksheet. And I'm going to be just kind of keeping track of the things that I want. I want to have an RC4. All right. Now we go on to C. What is the nominal size N of the mating features? Well, our nominal size, we're going to have to do some numbers here. So I'm going to drop this pen size down just a little bit. Um, our nominal size is two inches is what I recall the, what I recall it saying. So let's just check that out. Two inch diameter for the nominal size. Okay, excellent. So here we have two inches. What are the standard tolerance limits? I'm looking at D now. What are the standard tolerance limits for the mechanical fit chosen in part B? Answer to part C goes in the left column and all other data comes from the ANSI tables. Okay, so my nominal size goes over here. This is uh, 2.00. And now in order to get these other numbers, we're going to have to go to the ANSI tables and we have to go to the ANSI table that is associated with whatever fit class was chosen. In this case, fit class uh, RC, running clearance, uh, was chosen, and then RC4 is the specific class that we want. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna go over to that uh, part of the table, part of the tables, excuse me, and we're gonna see that there is a table for all of the fit classes. This is the running clearance fit table. And here we can see RC4. Switch to red on this. Okay. We can see right here RC4. So we now know that we're going to be interested in this column that's there and nothing else on the table needs to be paid attention to. And then on this part, I, I guess we do need to pay attention to this for a minute. Um, this is where we have the nominal size. The nominal size for our part is two inches. So we care about this row that's in here, this row. So now all we need to do is we need to go in here and find the row column that we care about. And that is the row column that we care about. So those are the numbers that we're gonna use in our, in our worksheet, okay? Let's see if I can um, try to describe what's going on here, okay? Uh, these numbers, right in this side, represent the clearances that are needed in order to have the RC fit behavior occur. And then these are the limits that need to be put on, these ones here are the limits that need to be put on the hole, and these are the limits that need to be put on the shaft. And we know that because it says hole right here and it says shaft right here and it says clearance right there. So we're going to um, come down here and look at that. And we're just gonna remember that this is the clearance section. This is the hole section, the hole section, okay. And this is the shaft se section. All right, so what we wanna do now is take these numbers that are in this area and transfer them over to the other sheet. 
I guess the best thing for me to do actually is just to write these down on a piece of paper. And once I've written them down on the piece of paper, I won't have to go back and forth between those two tables all the time. So I have 1.2 and 4.2, and I have plus 1.8, and I have zero, and I have minus 1.2, and I have minus 2.4. Those are the numbers that I will need in the worksheet, so I've just written them down there. Okay, now we're going back over to the worksheet. Here's the worksheet. So what I do now is I copy directly the numbers that uh, we had just written on this piece of paper directly into this section of the uh, worksheet. So I can just do that right now. This is 1.2, 1, 1.2, 1 and this is 4.2, and this is plus 1.8, and this is zero, and this is minus 1.2, and this is minus 2.4. Those numbers came directly from the table in exactly the same geometric layout uh, that they exist in the table, and they're just written right there. Okay, then what I do is I have to decide whether I was going to use the whole standard or the shaft standard. Now the example called for using the whole standard. So I want to use the whole standard, okay? And I'm using the whole standard for a clearance fit. Now what this tells me to do is uh, to calculate some numbers. What I'm going to be calculating are the DH and the DS numbers, which are the diameters of the holes and the diameters of the shaft in terms of their maximum allowable value, that's this one, and their minimum allowable value, that's that one, for the hole, and the maximum allowable shaft size and the minimum allowable shaft size, which is that one. And we're gonna calculate those and then those will go on the engineering drawing just as we see in this picture, let me find that picture. Okay, uh, this, this will be, these will be those numbers. Okay, we will, for the hole, and then these will be the numbers for the shaft. They will be put in the same exact format where we have the diameter symbol and then a large number and a small number right underneath it. That will be the maximum allowable size and the minimum allowable size for the thing that this is being pointed to. In this case, it's being pointed to that thing there. Okay, so now we're gonna calculate that. And it's simple, we're just gonna use the worksheet. Now you can find calculators online that will do this for you, and I think that's, there's nothing really wrong with that, but it is good to do this a couple of times by yourself so that you know what's going on, okay? All right, now what we need to remember is that these numbers that are right over here um, that come out of the table are all actually in thousandths of an inch. And when they're in thousandths of an inch, what that means is that uh, <clears throat> this number right here, for example, 1.8, is 1.8 thousandths of an inch. So it's 0 0.0018. That's what that number means. So I actually should be, um, should be writing that exactly that way in this in this worksheet or I'm going to I'm going to have some trouble. I don't want to have any trouble. I want it to be just right. So, uh, plus 0 0.0018. Excellent. What is that going to equal? 2.0018. Great. Now we go to the next one, which is DH2. DH2 is just exactly the nominal value, which is 2 even. Okay, all of this is going to be specified with basically four digits of precision, so I'm just going to write that in there right now. All right, then we're going to look at DS1. Okay, DS1 is going to be our nominal value, 2.0000 plus S1. S1 is right over here. S1 has a minus sign on it, so minus 0 0.0012. All right, what is that going to equal? What is that going to give us? That's going to give us something like 1.9988. Is that right? Yeah, add 12 to that. OK, 
Okay. All right, then what are we going to do for this next one? We're going to go to the next thing. We're going to say that's 2, or excuse me, it's n, which is 2.0000 plus s2. And what is s2? It's minus 2.4, thousandths of an inch, so minus 0 0.0024. What is that going to get us? That is going to get us 1.9976. Is that right? That's right. All right, so these are the critical numbers then. These numbers right here, this one, and then this one, and this one, and this one, these are the ones that show up on the engineering drawing. So in essence, then, we would transfer those to the engineering drawing, which I'm just going to write right here. So this is 2.0018, and this one is 2.000, and this one is 1.9988. And this one is 1.9976. And what we want to do now is we want to ask ourselves, does this make any sense? All right, so first of all, if I want a shaft to be in a hole and spinning freely, my shaft better be smaller than my hole. And my shaft will always be smaller than the hole if it is manufactured according to this spec that's right here. What this means is that the maximum size that the shaft will ever be is 1.9988. And the smallest the hole will ever be is 2. And the difference between those is 1.2 thousandths, which is exactly the clearance that's specified right up here. So I've just done a backwards check to kind of make sure that that part is correct. All right, now what happens when my shaft is absolutely the smallest and my hole is absolutely the biggest? Well then my shaft's coming in at this size and my hole's coming in at this size. And what am I getting out of that? I got 18 plus 24. What's 18 plus 24 gonna get me? 42, as in 4.2, 4.2 thousandths. Okay, which is actually exactly the other thing that it said in the clearance table. So this is Correct. I know I've done all my calculations correct on this. Now, why does this matter to us? Well, remember, we wanted to run at high speeds, we wanted minimal play, and we want to know how to specify the size of the hole and the size of the shaft so that we always get that performance. And the way to do it is to make sure that the shaft is made according to those numbers and the hole is made, made according to those numbers. And if we do that, that will work just absolutely 100% fine. Now what I'm going to do is pause for a second and look at some of the other tables that are in here because now we have got the size. We know how to put it on an engineering drawing, but we should do a small sanity check just to make sure that we know how to do this just right. So if we think for a moment about a shaft and we think about a hole, well, a shaft is easily made on a lathe. And a hole like this is not as easily made on a lathe when it's inside of a block, a block like this. So maybe we'll mill that out, okay? So when we use a lathe, we say that we're gonna turn it. And when we use a mill, we say we're gonna mill it, all right? So we wanna see if we can actually hold these tolerances that we are specifying to make sure we didn't specify something that's unduly expensive. So what we do then in that case is we use this table, which is table uh, 8.10. What's going on with 8.10 is that we have thing called tolerance grades. And here the tolerance grades go from four all the way up to 13. And then we can see various manufacturing processes down this side, and then we can see what tolerance grades they can hold. So we can see, for example, that turning, we can hold, uh, so by the way, I guess I should say that uh, when you have a large number, this is a very uh, loose tolerance, and when we have a small number, this is a very tight tolerance and therefore expensive and less expensive. So expensive for the 4s and less expensive for the 13. And we can see that um, the lathe can have uh, all the way down to a 7, okay? But milling can only go down to a 10. So let's just look at the shaft first. This will be easier for us to look at. 
Let's go ahead and look at this smallest one for a second here. Do I have weight? That's interesting. Okay. Let's look at this smallest one, which is this one. Tolerance grade seven. And what we do is we go over to the table that's right next to it, and we look at tolerance grade seven and nominal value two. Okay, is going to be in that in this row. We can come down here and we can see that it is possible for us to hold. 1.2 thousandths of an inch tolerance. So let's go see uh, in, our t in our example what we specified uh, and if we, if we can do that. Okay, this is great because what's going on here, let me switch colors so we can see what's going on. Uh, looking in this area, uh, we can see that the band between the upper limit on the shaft and the lower limit on the shaft is 1.2 thousandths. Is 1.2 thousandths. So we know that we can manufacture these tolerances without it being unduly expensive for the shaft. We now need to do the same, however, for the hole and see what happens. So we can look at this band that's in here on this one, and we can see that it's 1.8 thousandths. Let's go see if we can hold 1.8 thousandths with a mill. So we come back in here to this table. We look at the milling column, which is this one, and we go ahead and just pick the smallest, you know, we pick the smallest one that we have here so we can see if it's even possible. And that's tolerance grade 10. We move over to this next table. We better go back to our same uh, nominal value, which is two. And we're going to come over to tolerance grade 10. And tolerance grade 10 says that we can hold 4.5. Now, we're specifying that they, we need to hold 1.8 or something like that. I think it was around 1.8. Um, but we can't do that with machining. So machining is a bad operation for us to try to get that hole. Let's go back to the table here and see what would be a better way to do that. OK, so clearly not anything that's down below this because those are the same tolerance grades. Um, and so I can just, you know, start moving up, right? I could look at boring, which is a way of making a more precise hole. But uh, the way that is a really great way to make a precise hole is a thing called reaming. So what we would do is we would machine out that hole and then put a reamer on the inside of it, which would just tune up that hole to a tight tolerance. We can do that. Let's check out reaming and see if that will work for us, OK? So what we're doing here is we're looking at this number. And this number is tolerance grade eight, uh, six, excuse me, tolerance grade six. Tolerance grade six means that we can hold um, 0.7 thousandths of an inch. Now, we already know that that will be satisfactory for us because we need to hold as much as 1.8 thousandths of an inch. And if we ream, we can hold all the way down to uh, seven ten thousandths of an inch, basically. Okay, let's see if we could choose a manufacturing process that was maybe um, not reaming. We could also just do this boring thing, and that could get us down to a tolerance zone of eight. And let's go check the tolerance zone eight. This gets us to a one point eight, uh, which is actually exactly what we needed to hold for that part. So we could do a boring operation on this. Uh, and doing a boring operation might, might be good. So boring or reaming would work here, but milling would not for the tight tolerances that we've specified here in this drawing. OK, so what do we take away from this? We have largely seen that, for the example, we used the worksheet. We used the worksheet to um, figure out what the size of the hole and the size of the shaft should be so that we can guarantee an RC4 style functionality. That's what we want in order to get uh, a functional product. We needed, we needed those characteristics, high running speed, minimal play, um, and so on. I think it might have been medium running speed. But nevertheless, we read the example. We went back to table one. We looked. Uh, we went back to table one. Let's see, where is that? We looked back at table one. We looked at the characteristics in the application. We chose which one we wanted. Once we had the RC4 fit, uh, 
What we did is we went to the RC table, found the RC4 column, found the row that corresponded with the nominal range, took the numbers that are in the red box there, wrote them on a piece of paper, uh, though you don't have to do that, wrote them on a piece of paper, then we went over to the worksheet, transferred those numbers directly into the worksheet where we had a um, sort of some symbolic names for them so we could put them into an equation easily. And then we executed the equations to figure out the size of the hole and the size of the shafts at their maximum possible value and their minimum possible value so that if they were manufactured according to those numbers, we would get the performance that we need. We saw how we could put those on an engineering drawing. And then we went the extra step to think about the manufacturing process and that we could actually do what was required uh, to get the performance that we want. If we were to use, say, milling, we found that we could not do that. So we had to go on to reaming or boring. That is how all these pieces come together uh, into a, a way of specifying how parts should fit together. Now in this chapter, you're gonna try that with this famous mechanism called the Geneva wheel. The Geneva wheel mechanism is an interesting one. It's one where with continuous mo movement on the input shaft, continuous rotational movement, the output shaft is intermediately rotating. See that going on there? You're going to model one of these and produce all the proper fits so that it would work, and then you're gonna create an animation. Okay, that's it. I wish you the best on this. I'll see you in the next video.